Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. When I first started practicing Zen seriously in, um, I don't know, it was a while ago now, anyway, and joined my first Sangha, <clears throat> it was a place in New Jersey called um, Monmouth Zen Circle, and it was in the uh, in the orbit of the San Francisco Zen Center. It was a Soto Sangha, and as such, Dogen was like, you know, in the pantheon of Zen greats. Um, so there was something that Dogen had written, I believe, and again, it's gone back a ways and my memory may not serve me properly, but there was something about the um, conditions, the environment of the meditation hall and what's uh, the optimum scenario for that. And in Monmouth, we had, um, you know, dim lights, not totally dark, but dim. And the altar with the candles and the incense and um, the usual things you'd find in a uh, Zen meditation hall. And there was a scroll on the wall, as one would expect. And it being a Soto Sangha, we faced the wall. And as mundane as it might sound in retrospect, although not to me, because I think it's still the coolest thing going, but to you it might seem mundane. One of the first great realizations that I had was when I was sitting there on my cushion and the lights were dim and I'm staring at the wall and I notice that my eyelids and the shadowy wall were exactly the same color. Like I couldn't tell where one started and the other one began or started and stopped. There was no differentiation between eyelid and wall at that point. And I thought that was just the most brilliant thing I had ever experienced. And it quite possibly was considering some of the experiences I've had. It was definitely uh, top of the list, let's say. So you may have noticed that uh, my meditation room here in the Hermitage, which is a hermitage basically because uh, it's a room where I meditate in solitude because there's this pandemic, you see, and face-to-face -face contact and getting a whole lot of people sitting in a single room was frowned upon <clears throat> with good reason. So you can see, you know, glancing around, it's not particularly dark here. And you may also hear the roar of traffic outside my window. I'm here in Western Massachusetts on one of the four main east-west routes in, in the state. And especially as you get out to Western Mass, there are fewer and fewer choices. So I'm on one of them and it's got a fair amount of traffic. Usually lightens up in the evening some, like there are fewer semi-trucks coming down the road and, and testing their brakes as they come down the hill. And much as how the robins and other birds have 
uh, flown, migrated, headed south. Along with them have gone the motorcycles. So we don't really have that many motorcycles at this point. However, there's still a lot of vehicular traffic, you might say. And uh, if you pay attention, you will probably hear some of that as we go along. So my meditation room is neither dark nor particularly quiet. It's, it's definitely like 179 degrees away from how things were when I was sitting in, in Long Branch, New Jersey with the Monmouth Zen Circle. And that's okay. There were a number of things that struck me going from Soto practice to San practice. One Mind Zen is in um, the lineage of Sung San and Thich Thien An, who's a Korean and Vietnamese uh, teachers that were in the lineage of. And when I first stumbled upon original Mind Zen down in Princeton, New Jersey, I thought, great, I don't have to drive an hour and a half to go meditate anymore because I'm like five minutes away from this place. So that will be really cool. So I went there one Sunday night and I met um, Andre Tyson Halau, who was the uh, guiding teacher at Original Mind. And he and I have been teacher and student for ages now, probably 10, 12 years or something like that. And when I first started sitting with Original Mind, it was kind of weird because rather than facing the wall, like you would in a Soto setting or even facing across like you would in a Rinzai setting, we sat facing forward toward the altar. And the walking meditation was different. Like it wasn't how I was used to doing it. So immediately at that point, my mind started thinking, these guys are a bunch of heretics. They don't know how to practice Zen. And eventually it came to the point where I slowly realized that just as my eyelids and the wall had no delineation between them, so too did Zen practice. Zen practice has nothing to do with the number of foot candles in your environment nor does it have anything to do with the decibel level of the ambient sound while you're meditating. Zen practice doesn't even have all that much to do with meditation when you get down to it. What it does have to do with is realizing your true nature from moment to moment to moment. Now we sit on a cushion and we meditate, face out, face across, face forward, whatever it is, in order to gain some insight into our minds, to give ourselves a little bit of a break from the traffic and the lights and work and, you know, children and spouses and all the other things that can interfere with self-reflection. We give ourselves a little break and we just sit on a cushion and meditate. Sometimes we'll just observe the breath. A lot of people, when they start, start by counting breaths, like one on the exhale, two on the inhale, three on the exhale, and so on, up to 10. And then I, I would always tell people that 
when you hit 15, don't become discouraged. Just go back to one and try and pay more attention this time and hit 10 and then start at one again. Don't beat yourself up. Drop it, let it go. Other people chant softly to themselves. Uh, I've been known to chant Namu Amita Bol. Uh, na on one, on one exhale, Mu on the inhale, and so on. Other people just sit. They maybe don't even pay attention to their breaths, let alone count them. They're aware of their mind. They're aware of their surroundings. They're aware of their body. They're aware of the delineation being kind of fuzzy and gray between things. Even here in my bright and loud meditation room, I still can't quite, when I have my eyes half shut, can't quite tell where my eyelids end and the blurry stuff kind of starts. It's kind of veiled. I know it's there because I can, I can perceive that something is there, but the actual delineation of eyelid other stuff isn't really there. And that's another one of those revelations that perhaps we can all have is that as we go through our daily lives, we can look and say to ourselves, where does the wind stop and the sky begin? Where does the air stop and the pores in my skin begin? What's that? actual hard delineation. Where is the actual concrete delineation between one page in the chant book and the next? When they're in contact with each other, are all the little fibers of one page intermingling with the other? When we see our true nature, we can see that the differences between me and you, me and the chair, the air and the wind, the wind and the sky, they're all kind of fuzzy. So maybe then rather than being dualistic and creating boundaries where there really aren't any. We should perhaps see that an injury to one is an injury to all, to use a phrase that I'm borrowing. That when I lie to you, I am not doing myself any service by doing things like that. It's all gray, the eyelid, the wall, where does one start and the other one end? <laughs>